Well, I want to thank you for your participation in the Cracking the Physician Code course. Of course, the goal of this is to help you accelerate your growth by acquiring more doctor clients. And this is our last and eighth module. So before we go on to what we're doing today, let me just step back and see where we have gone. So there's three parts of this course. The first part was about the 10 laws of physician engagement, the ways in which doctors are different than business-minded clients. In part two, we went through the B to D blueprint. This is a blueprint to help you break into the medical market most quickly and really build an infrastructure that's gonna support your growth. Part three today is really your plan. So how are we gonna reverse engineer success now that you've gone through the whole B to D blueprint? How are you gonna break this down and actually execute yourself? So in summary, the reason that there is this course is that doctors are wired differently than business-minded clients. And so you want to treat people who wear the white coats doctors differently than you treat a more business-minded client. And this is of particular interest to you because the core difference really has to do with doctors and their relationship with money. So if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to read The Myth of the Rich Doctor and the nine money mistakes that doctors make so that you can really see that doctors manage their money differently than business-minded people do. So we talked about the 10 laws of physician engagement. You've got a handout and you will find that you get the best results when your actions align with the 10 laws of physician engagement. If you're ever struggling, what you might want to do is pull out these 10 laws and ask yourself, okay, are there ways in which I'm not aligning what I'm doing with the 10 laws? I know that when I work with my private coaching clients, once we identify the law that's out of sync and correct it, my clients get a much better result. So then we talked about this B to D blueprint. Remember, we're not quite talking about a B to B business model. We're not quite talking about a B to C model. There's some peculiarities of doctors. And so here are the steps that are gonna help you get to the really high ROI phase. Um, and you also remember that the speed at which your referral-based practice grows is driven by your ability to deliver the right message to the right person at the right time. Your perceived value, the value that your doctor perceives. And third, the strength of your tribal affiliation. So there's a lot of things that make it challenging to break into the medical market. But the reason that this is worth it is that in the end, doctors can and will talk about you with their friends and colleagues. So if you're delivering some great value, if you've got a yummy treat that you've given to them, they are gonna wanna help their friends. They're gonna wanna pass this along to others. Okay, so real briefly, the first step is to define your focus. Don't try to be all things to all doctors. You want to select three to five groups of doctors that have a similar source of financial pain, who network with each other so that they can talk about you and with whom you have affinity. Step number two is to gather intelligence. So you wanna be able to see the world from the doctor's eyes. So this intelligence is gonna allow you to be at the right place and the right time with the right marketing message. The basic tool for this step is the informational interview. And at first, you're just gonna want to conduct these informational interviews to find out how things work among your tribes. But remember that this can always be used as a marketing tool. Step number three is groom for engagement. So your website, your online presence is all set up for business-minded people. However, how can you be tweaked so that you're ready to go to the medical ball, if you will? And expert positioning is key. Doctors want to work with experts. They want to work with people who work with doctors just like them, 
day in and day out. So how do you position yourself to look like this expert? Step number four was to generate leads. And remember, we talked about the three buckets of leads. There's family, friends, and fans, people who already know, like, and trust you. The second bucket are the power partners. So these are people who have lists of doctors. And if you can build good relationships with them, ideally, the power partners are going to put your yummy treats in front of their entire list. The third bucket of leads are the doctor information seekers. And so these are the doctors who are out uh, on the internet looking for answers to their questions. They're going to meetings, they're reading publications. So you can put your breadcrumbs in front of them and that's how they can find you. Um, the next step is to build sales funnels. Um, so your marketing campaigns are the um, things on your to-do list. You know, what kind of campaign are you gonna launch? We know that doctors are gonna need on average between seven to 10 contacts with you before they convert. So your sales funnel is what your doctors see from you. What's your first date with the doctor? What's the second date? What's the third date? And so you can build numbers of different sales funnels. Your marketing campaigns can be like the water that's poured into these sales funnels. And then the last step that we talked about in the last module was to cultivate a culture of introductions. So when I'm working with my high performing um, financial advisors, inevitably what happens is they tell me, you know what, I, I want to step back from marketing because my phone is just ringing. You know, I'll answer a ringing phone and it'll be a doctor saying, hey, I'm a friend of a client of yours. He says you do a great job. Um, can we see what you can do for me? So this is what I call escape velocity. This is where you really harness the real power of doctors, which is their propensity to share resources with each other. So we want to get there as quickly as possible. And to get there, we want to shift from a hunter-gatherer mentality where you're just thinking about how you're going to get that next doctor client to really an agrarian mindset where you're cultivating this culture. And if you think about that from the very beginning, if you think about that's where you want to get to, chances are good that you're going to start differently from the very, very beginning. All right, so the, the three main things that you want to think about as you build your own business are, is, first of all, how do you get access to doctors? And remember, if you've got a doctor who can open the red velvet rope for you, you're going to do that much more quickly. Second is trust building. The speed at which you build your practice is the speed at which you build trust. And there's some science behind trust building. And third, leverage is important. So anyone can acquire doctor clients if they throw enough time and money at it. But how do you do this in a smart way so you really get the most impact for the efforts that you invest? So remember, it's tough to get in front of doctors. And if you think about meeting with doctors in time and in space, you can be synchronous, you can be at the same place at the same time, or you can be asynchronous. So if you think about you know, how you pay bills, if you go to see a bank teller, you're at the same place and the same time. Um, if you go to an ATM, uh, that means you don't need the bank teller, but now you can go online and do all of your banking online. So there's this whole spectrum of high touch to high tech. You can be in front of Dr. Prospects in a synchronous or asynchronous patterns. And so as you're building your sales funnels, you want to think about how each individual marketing campaign gets designed. And you, know, you wanna find out 
where are your doctors? If you're dealing with boomer doctors, boomer doctors still actually like to get in front of people and have real life conversations. Millennials, on the other hand, even when they're in the presence of other doctors, tend to be on their smartphones. So you want your campaigns um, and your leverage designed so that it fits well with your given tribes. So if I were to take a look at really where the highest ROI place is, I'm going to share with you this idea that um, that actually I just developed for one of my videos that I'm calling the success triad. So if you are thinking about how you position yourself as an expert, if you are thinking about how to build digital sales funnels, especially if you find that your doctors are online looking for things, and if you think about how to engage physician evangelism, at the dead center is where you are most likely to get your quickest wins. Um, so we're going to talk today about building your B2D blueprint. What's actually going to go on your list? Before I do that, though, I just wanted to share a few more ideas that really reflect some of the struggles that I had myself when I made my transition from a practicing physician to an entrepreneur. So I really, really had a hard time selling. This was like a horror moving for me. And when I first became an entrepreneur, I, I would say every day, you know, I hate selling. Um, you know, I love helping people, but I hate selling. And when you wake up every morning with an attitude like that, it doesn't set the stage for a strong business outcome. So I knew I had to do things differently. And I decided that I just need to think about selling in a different way. You know, I didn't have to be the fast talking Billy Mays. So what I decided was that marketing was engaging others in conversation. And this obviously works best when you're talking about something that's of interest to your prospect. And then selling is inspiring others to take action. And each encounter I decided needed to have each element. It was kind of like the human heartbeat, love dub, love dub. So you have to engage somebody in conversation by knowing what they want to learn about and then inspiring them to take action. Understanding that the action that you take should align with the level of trust that you have built. So once I shifted this mindset um, and I said to myself every day, okay, selling is serving. I am here to serve people things transformed for me. So I invite you to think about your relationship to marketing and selling. Could that use some tweaking to help you get better results? Now, as we're talking about selling, let me ask you this question. Who do you think your competition is? And a lot of advisors think, you know, it's the big boys with the big marketing budgets who are advertising on TV. But I am going to suggest to you that your real competition, the one that you've got to worry about, is the current way that doctors are building wealth. Because everyone has a plan to build wealth. It actually takes a pretty big activation energy to inspire somebody to do things differently than the way they're doing them now. The main reason that somebody would be interested in making a change is that they have pain. And the good news for you is that there's an awful lot of pain among doctors. Remember, we talked about the fact that about 40% of doctors reported that they were burned out last year. So they are experiencing toxic stress. As you go out and speak with doctors, you're going to hear questions like, you know, how can I move up retirement by five to 10 years? How can I generate other forms of revenue so that I have the option of seeing patients if I want. So this financial pain is actually great news for you because now you have a whole group 
of prospects who are more interested in listening to what you have to say as long as you understand where they are and what they want. Okay, so why do physicians change? Well, first, there's just human nature. Um, I was just listening to a TED talk yesterday that said the brain is wired with kind of two pedals. There is the um, gas pedal and there is the brake. And what the brain wants to do is put as many things on autopilot as possible. And when there's a change, the brain will automatically just like put on the brake. So that's human nature. We kind of get that. But in addition, there's an extra layer with doctors. Um, doctors want to be safe, right? So most doctors don't want to be the first doctor to try a new medication, to try a new surgical procedure. They want to wait until most of the people who they surround themselves with are doing those same things. So what you want to do is make your services, your educational content, you want to make that the standard within targeted groups of doctors. So you become the go-to guy or gal within a certain group. And remember, the other reason that doctors might not be so open to um, your message is that they have beliefs about their own knowledge about wealth building. So remember we talked about the fact that any single bit of information can go in one of these pie chart slices. There are things you know you know and there are things you know you don't know and that's kind of the safe zone. Then there are things you don't know you don't know or know you know and you're wrong or know you know and you ignore. That's the unsafe zone. So compared to business-minded people, doctors tend to have a bigger unsafe zone. So it's important that you understand what a doctor's beliefs are um, because there, there might be some flaw that could help you from moving forward. Okay, so how do you facilitate um, action? How do you help doctors shift from the status quo? Um, well, the first thing to do is just take it slow. I remember um, there was a patient, this is when I was operating, there was a patient who um, was having a heart attack. He was done in the cardiac cath lab and the cardiologists were trying to get a clot out of a vessel that fed the heart. But instead of getting it out, it went in further. And this guy was dying. So he had to crash up to the OR. Instead of like the five minute scrub, the nurse just like poured betadine over the guy's chest. I, I went out and I scrubbed really, really quickly. And then I was really trying to get into my gloves and gowns in a very hurried way. And the wise scrub nurse says to me, Vicki, slow down. A man in a hurry dresses slowly. So while you want to get this prospect to convert to your client very quickly, if a doctor feels this urgency, if a doctor feels your desperation, they're, they're just going to go away. Take it slow. Never be too invested in any one doctor. Instead, think about the bigger picture. Think about how effectively you're filling your sales funnels. Um, think about how effectively um, any one marketing campaign is and how you can convert them. You want to take a series of yeses. The first yes is always hardest to get. So you want to make that first yes something that is a very, very low risk. So you always want to offer a safe call to action. Second thing that you can do to facilitate action is to play follow the leader. Remember, we talked about the fact that doctors behave like tropical fish. They tend to congregate together and move together under the same direction. So as you're telling stories, you don't want to tell stories about you. You want to tell stories about other doctors. As you're conducting the informational interviews, and you're talking with key physician opinion leaders and they share their pearls of wisdom. 
ask if you can share those pearls because you know if you just drop into conversation with the prospect oh yes i just happened to be talking with the president of your medical association well that elevates your expert positioning and now doctors are going to want to hear more about what you have to say so as you're speaking with doctors don't shine the spotlight on yourself tell stories about other doctors in this woe to win story um, telling stories about a doctor who was really worried about money and now knows they can retire, you know, five years earlier. Those are the kinds of stories that inspire other doctors to take action. And then third, make it feel familiar. So for most doctors, dealing with their money is sort of outside of their day-to-day -day experience. It makes them feel uncomfortable. They're a little embarrassed to have made the financial choices that they've made. But anytime you can bring them back to familiar territory, it makes it easier for them to move. So it's kind of like the way that Velcro works. Velcro has loops on one end and hooks on the other. And it sticks because you hook into something that's familiar. So anytime that you can use medical metaphors, you can reframe wealth building as optimizing financial health and talking with doctors like that. It makes it easier for them to make the transformation and it also makes it much more likely that they're gonna be processing this with their thinking brain rather than their feeling brain. So you wanna trigger mirror neurons. Remember, our brain is wired with these mirror neurons. So. Um, we know that we want to work with people we know, like, and trust. And the, the statement, I'm like you, really, uh, I like you, I'm sorry, is really, I like you. I see part of myself reflected in you. So another trust building tip is to do what you can to activate mirror neurons. Now, here are two of my friends. They are both expert entrepreneurs and communicators, and you can see them mirroring their body language. I don't know who is mirroring whom because they're both so good, but when you can trigger these mirrors, and by the way, you might wanna just try this experiment of mirroring body language, mirroring speech patterns, and I think you'll see how powerful that is. Um, but the way that you conduct yourself can also trigger mirror neurons. And so you've probably noticed that every time you go and see a doctor, the doctor does pretty much the same thing. You sit down and talk um, and the doctor asks, you know, what brings you in today? Starts asking questions. Then there's the exam. And then a doctor, the doctor sits down with you again and says, okay, here are the puzzle pieces. Here's how I'm putting it together. And um, here are some ways we can move forward. So this encounter is summarized in the medical record as what's called a SOAP note. These are the four elements of the examination. And my guess is that this is already how you're conducting your discovery. But if you do this with intention, that is gonna help doctors build trust with you. So let's start with the S. That's the subjective story. So some people have stories about their money. Um, you know, you may run into doctors who were worried about being homeless and they really have 10 million in assets. You might find doctors who think that they're all ready for retirement because they have 500,000 in assets completely clueless that that's really not going to take them very far in retirement. So that's where you want to start. You want to start with the doctor's version of the story. Then you want to move on to the objective information. So those are the numbers. You know, what does a doctor have and where does the doctor have it? Um, chances are pretty good that it's going to take a while to collect all of this objective information because in general doctors are not very well organized. Um, then as you take these puzzle pieces, the subjective and objective story, you put them together 
and you create your assessment. And, and so this is basically your take on the future. Doctor, what I hear you say is that you'd like to move up retirement. You wanna maintain your current lifestyle and your costs are about 300,000 a year after taxes. You've got 500,000 in assets right now. And so what that means is that if you retire, you should be able to support yourself for the next X number of years. So you can continue on this course or, and then you can move into your recommended plan. Or here are some other options. So when you actually use this language, subjectively, doctor, what I hear you saying about your money is, objectively, when we actually look at where your assets are, my assessment is that if you continue on this path, this is where you'll wind up, but we can explore some other plans. When you do this, doctors are just gonna have a sense of comfort, like, oh, oh, she gets me, he gets me. Um, using medical metaphors is very important. Remember last in the last module, we talked about the FIPA form, um, something that will assure doctors that you're gonna maintain their privacy. Um, Anything that the doctor does, you, you can borrow from. So let's say, for example, you want a doctor to collect those records. Well, did you know that you could go online and buy prescription pads that have your name on it? Then you can write doctors a prescription to collect their forms and they'll laugh at it, but it will get the job done. Because like on a deep basis, doctors are wired to look obey the medical rules. So next time you go to your doctor's office, take a look at what the doctor is doing and think about how you can borrow from that to inspire more doctors to take action. Okay, um, now I, I wanna talk about something just a little different that will hopefully help you. And um, that's that not all doctors respond to financial pain the same way. So when I was a practicing surgeon, you know, I basically did, just did a couple of operations because my focus was breast cancer. And what I noticed is that even though I basically did just a couple operations, patients would respond very, very differently. And what I concluded was that this really doesn't have anything to do with me. This has to do with how people respond to pain. And I think that part of this is part of our DNA. Like we know that redheads, for example, um, respond to pain. They experience pain in a much more profound way. But I think that there are cultural factors here too. You know, the way that our parents responded to us when we fell down. So here are the five pain personality. So you're going to have a pain personality and your prospect or client is going to have a pain personality. And here is what the five are. The first is the strong stoic. So I operated in Seattle. There's a lot of Scandinavians there. And the Scandinavian culture takes pride in being strong and there's some shame to being vulnerable or to being weak. So the strong stoic wants to put on a happy front and basically mask their pain. Um, so, you know, I had a friend who said, you know, when I was growing up, you know, unless you were dying, we just didn't go to the doctor. And there were an awful lot of patients that I saw who had to be in an awful lot of pain before they finally came in to see the doctor. Um, then there's the worried well, and I'm a worried well. Um, in medicine, we call them the, the hypochondriacs, now cyberchondriacs. Um, there's a financial part too. You know, these are the people who are worried about being bag ladies or, or homeless when they have tons and tons of assets. Um, so the worried well, they're always going to be worried about some terrible thing. And you would obviously deal with a worried well much different than you deal with a strong stoic. Then there's the ostrich. And the ostrich basically wants to hide his or her 
head in the sand. You know, this is the guy who's, you know, in his Barca lounger popping Tums for his heart attack because, you know, he absolutely refuses to consider the possibility that this could be a heart attack. Then there is the victim, and the victim often will have a very, very sad story about how this person and that person let them down, and you try to help them only to discover that really what they want is to hang on to their pain because that is where their identity come from. And I decided in practice that um, I, I just didn't want to work with any victims. You know, I would much rather work with people I could genuinely help. And then the fifth pain personality is the ideal. So this is the patient, at least, who just doesn't come in too early. They don't come in too late. They just seem really well attuned to their body. Now, the reason that these pain personalities are so important is that once you know your pain personality, you can adjust your behaviors so that you behave more like the ideal. So like if you're playing badminton and you know your serve tends to list to the right, you can make adjustments so that your serve goes where you want it to go. So you've got your own um, you've got your own pain personality and hopefully you've sort of figured out who you are. And then as you meet with your prospects and clients, you might want to actually just share this system and ask them, which one are they? Um, and there are some pairs that don't actually do very well. So my surgical career started when I had this life threatening emergency and so being a worried well you know every little pain i had afterwards you know i wondered oh is something bad happening is my incision opening up you know but the person who was my main caregiver was a strong stoic and as far as they were concerned nothing could be going wrong so as you're seeing people figure out who they are, and then help them with what they really want and need. So what does the strong stoic want? The strong stoic wants to be seen as powerful and healthy. And most doctors are strong stoics when it comes to their money. Like they could have been trying to be a financial do-it-yourself for an awful long time now and not getting great results. So if you're dealing with a strong stoic, recognize their courage in reaching out for help. So always be talking about their strength and their courage. That's what they want. When you're talking about the worry well, just understand that their worries are really painful. It is hard to live inside of this financial anxiety. So if you find a worried well, what you want to do is tell them they are not in this alone. You never want them to worry alone. You want to set up a system so that you're not just helping them manage their money, but you're helping them manage their worries about their money. So with these kinds of people, you probably want to plan on regular contact with them and you want to have a plan for what they do when they sink into their worries. Um, with the ostrich, you just want to basically yes and uh, that's a that's a word i learned from improv when you are in an improv group um and you join a scene if somebody says um you know i baked you a birthday cake you don't say hey my birthday's not for another three months you say oh, yes and you bake my favorite kind chocolate cake so with ostriches you want a yes and so if an ostrich is telling you that you know they are set for retirement, um, you can say yes, and maybe we can run through the numbers again. Um, so ostriches respond really well to authority figures. So anytime you can quote a financial expert or compare them to you know the key physician opinion leader, that works really well. Um, I'll let you decide whether or not you want to work with victims, um, but. Again, there's 
you know, there's only so many days that you have in a year and you need to decide whether or not uh, you want to invest your time with victims. You might also want to think about your current clients and see if maybe you want to do a little housekeeping and maybe refer them on now. Speaking of house cleaning, um, you're probably here because you're really successful. You have other things that you are doing, probably full time. And so in order to make room for these extra doctor clients that you're gonna get, one of your questions is, how are you gonna clean up your existing practices? How can you get more leverage with your time? Can you hire somebody else? Um, can you um, maybe give some of your um, clients to maybe a junior colleague? You need to think about how you're gonna clean out time in space in order to get your new doctors in. Okay, next, um, I just wanted to share some lessons from the real masters of marketing to doctor and influencing the purchasing choices of doctors, which is the pharmaceutical industry. Now, they are evidence-based. They study what works and they do what works. So here's what they do if it works for them. I invite you to think about what it can do for you. So lesson number one is to give gifts. Uh, they um, spend about half of their marketing dollars on gifts because gifts work. Gifts activate the law of reciprocity. Now, doctors know that if they accept a gift of more than $10 in value from pharma, their name gets reported to a national database and no doctor wants their name there. So they're, they're already gonna be a little hesitant about accepting gifts, but pharma's still doing it, I think that you should do it too. So I think that the best gift is high value educational content, it's books, it's videos with your pearls of wisdom, but you can also do the little trinkets too. Um, you can use the notepads. Everyone uses notepads. Um, you can get bookmarks. You can get thumb drives. Um, you can do the pens. Um, there's even like this cute little stressometer um, that's like a six inch ruler and you put your thumb on it and it will tell you your level of stress. You can get that branded. Um, but give gifts. Think about stacking your gift closet and give yummy treats. Lesson number two is to educate. Pharma actually um, sponsors a whole bunch of continuing medical education. As you're thinking about your marketing campaigns, educational marketing works. Third lesson is to talk with the influencers. So if, um, if a, a drug company is developing a new drug, let's say for MS, the very first thing that they do is they talk to the top thought leaders in MS. And you want to do the same with these informational interviews. You want to identify the key physician opinion leaders. You want to be talking to them. Next Pharma attends physician gatherings. You can too. Um, lesson number five, they sponsor events. You could potentially do that too. Let's say for example, that, um, oh, a hospital um, who has a lot of doctors with whom you want to work, um, they're doing a fundraiser. Maybe you can sponsor a fundraiser. Lesson number six is to recruit physician leaders. Um, and I really encourage to you to get doctors on your advisory board. And then lesson number seven, they know that they've got to repeat their message. They don't expect to talk with a doctor, you know, one time about the new drug and have the doctor prescribe it. They know that they've got to expose the doctor to messages like seven to 10 times. So think about how you can incorporate these into your plans. Okay, and the, the uh, last thing I want to talk about is this idea that you are a financial leader. You provide leadership. I mean, when we were talking about the way that sales is changing, um, from like a prom to a TOLO event, where instead of you pursuing doctors, doctors are finding you. We talked about the fact that in this dance together, you are 
offering the financial leadership. And you want to attract doctors who are going to follow your lead. So um, what is leadership? Well, leadership is communicating to people their worth and potential so clearly that they are inspired to see it in themselves. So there's this epidemic of despair among doctors. You can be the person who brings this hopeful message, who captures this dream that a doctor has for his life, for his family, for his legacy, and help make that happen. Okay, so here are some ways to sort of reinforce your leadership position. Now, when I was on the radio, one of the radio hosts told me that you can either end your sentence in an upswing or you can end your sentence in a downswing. And in general, upswing builds curiosity and downswing builds trust. So you might wanna think about your speech patterns but especially if you're a woman, think about intentionally doing more downswinging. That builds trust. All right, you wanna use the right body language. So a leader's body is open and expansive. The leadees is closed and folded, as you see in this picture here. Now, we know that your posture can actually inform your mindset. So I know an awful lot of people who will go into the bathroom and assume this Superman pose for, you know, 30 to 60 seconds to kind of pump themselves up. You might want to try that and see how that works. And then um, I'd like to offer you this connection prescription, which is basically a set of leadership skills. So I developed this actually for family caregivers who are dealing with loved ones in pain. But since you're dealing with people in financial pain, I think that this might be helpful for you too. So step number one in the connection prescription is set the emotional thermostat. I don't know if you've ever walked into a room, there's been an argument and you can like feel it in the air. So um, you can either go with the emotional temperature that's already there, or you can set the thermostat. So I remember, you know, my first day as a medical student in the hospital wards, there was a code. We rushed up to the room. There was this sea of white coats. So I went and stood next to my resident advisor and uh, he leans over to me and says, Vicki, what's the very first thing that you do um, when you arrive at a code? And I thought, well, ABCs, right? He said, no, the very first thing that you do is take your own pulse. So you want to keep the calm. When you talk with people about their money, they tend to be very anxious. They can be very chaotic in their thinking. And you want them to catch your calm. You don't want to catch their chaos. So set the emotional thermostat. You want to help people get to calm. That might be one of your main challenges as a financial advisor. Second, let them take center stage. This is about them. It's about their money. So um, a friend of mine um, has a wife who has breast cancer. And um, they had driven a long way to see a specialist. Um, she had a lot of back pain. So on the couple hour drive home, she was actually lying down in the back seat. They'd gotten some really, really bad news from that specialist. And Dave told me that he was in the driver's seat thinking about, oh my God, what was his life gonna be like without his wife? And as he was thinking about that, he heard some gentle sobs from the back seat. His wife was crying. He'd never seen his wife cry once during this whole thing. And he knew at that moment that he had to get out of his concern for him and put his wife in center stage because this was really about her. It had to be for her right now. Now, there was gonna be time for him later, offline. So when you're dealing with doctors, you know, there might be 
a financial disappointment. And you might think about your own role in that financial disappointment. And you can think about that later. But when you're dealing with your doctors, it has to be about them right now. Let them take center stage. Um, next is shield them from the complexity. You could wow doctors with your intimate understanding of all sorts of things, but you are gonna be best off when you're offering them the easy button. Next, master the fine art of verbal persuasion. So it's easier for some people to talk with new people than others. And so my question for you is where are you in the extrovert introvert continuum? Now, what's the difference? Um, extroverts get recharged by being around others. Introverts get recharged by being alone. So I'm an introvert. I get recharged by being alone. But I'm out, you know, speaking to thousands of people. I can get out there, I can speak, I can do all sorts of things, but I know I am going to pay a personal price. So there is this new phrase called an ambivert, who has a little of both, a little extroversion and a little introversion. And you know, the question is, okay, who's more likely to be successful in business? And it turns out that this was studied. And it turns out that the ambivert, the person who has a little introvert and a little extrovert, does the best. And this kind of makes sense from what we already know about doctors. You got to get out there and talk to doctors. Every sale begins with a conversation. So the extrovert in you is going to help you get out into the trenches, actually meet and talk with doctors. However, the introvert part of you can be harnessed as you listen to doctors. So you don't want to be doing all of the talking. You want to be doing some listening. So think about where you are on this spectrum and how you might want to bring either some more introverted or extroverted qualities into your campaigns. So I will just tell you that this verbal persuasion is a skill that can be learned and improved. And just as a little tip, Oprah once said that she's interviewed over 40,000 people and she said, when it comes right down to it, everyone wants the same thing. They want to know, do you hear me? Do you see me? Does what I think matter to you? And that's what your doctor prospects want. They want to know, do you hear them? Do you see them? Is what's important to them important to you too? All right, next you wanna act from your wisest self. So we all grow like rings on a tree. We evolve from childhood into adulthood. And what's kind of interesting is that we also know how to recover from trauma usually. So if you had a trauma in your early years, let, let's say that your parents lost a house in foreclosure and they gave you the skills and tools in order to deal with that, you would be fine. You would actually just grow and develop. But let's say that you had an early trauma around money and there wasn't an adult to give you the adult skills to deal with it. Well, every time in your adult life you faced that trauma, it's kind of like you reverted back to the kid you were in the initial trauma. It's sort of like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So you know that if a soldier is experiencing that, you know, they're not in Afghanistan anymore, but when they hear a truck backfire, they're back in Afghanistan. So if somebody has had financial trauma early on, they might not be responding like the mature 50-year-old cardiothoracic surgeon that they are they might re be responding like a seven-year-old. If you see that kind of thing happening where somebody is just not out of character, not in character, they're doing something that, that is odd, have a talk with them about what happened in their childhood. Ask them about their first childhood experience about money. 
um, because chances are good that, you know, once you actually get back to that initial trauma, it's kind of like helping a kid who's worried that there's monsters under the bed. You shine a flashlight there and you show them, hey, you know, there's nothing under there. Once you go back to that early childhood trauma, um, it's, it's kind of like shining the flashlight under the bed. And, you know, suddenly this cardiothoracic surgeon can can tap into their real adult self again. Similarly, you might find that there are certain people or certain things that trigger you. Like maybe you have a prospect who just rubs you the wrong way. And maybe when you really think about why, it's because this prospect um, reminds you of an uncle who traumatized you, you know, at a family wedding when you were five years old. So if you find yourself not quite being yourself, you want to ask yourself, okay, like what's triggering me? What's going on? Our goal is to always be our highest and most evolved self. You know, on your computer, you're always trying to run the most recent updated software. You know, you don't want to be running the software from 30 years ago. The same thing is true in business building. Okay, next, know your limits. So I remember getting woken up one night. It was my mother calling from Hawaii. She was in the emergency room. She was told she needed her gallbladder out. And would I come to Hawaii and do that for her? Well, there are all sorts of reasons why the answer to that question had to be no. But know your limits. You know, are there people that you do or do not want to work with? Are there situations that you do or do not want to work with? Sometimes saying no is the very best thing that you can do to build your practice. Don't have any shame about saying no. Okay, and last, know where you're headed. So have a vision of the, the practice that you're really, really trying to build, and then think about the best way to get there. You know, the thing about, say, you know, being on social media and doctors are on social media. So you might want to invest in social media. Well, you can spend hours a day on social media. So you want to guard your time. You want to make sure that all of the investments that you make are helping you get to where you want to go. So my prescription for health is be who you are, know what you know, do what you need to do. My prescription for building a healthy practice is just this too. So there's no two people who've ever gone through the course who've built their practice in the same way. So you want to build this practice in a way that reflects who you are. You wanna do things that are gonna be fun and easy for you. Like maybe you just love doing videos, but you hate writing. Okay, that's fine. So make your videos. And if you do want to have a book, you know, maybe you put your name on the cover of my book. If you love to write, yes, write your own book. And if you hate being in front of a video camera, you know, if you want to make videos, do this voiceover um, like you're seeing right now. And find that sweet spot. Find that place where you're really hitting your home runs and then try to spend most of your time there. Okay, so that's kind of the overview. Now let's go into really what we're here today to do. These 10 action steps. Um, what do you actually do? I mean, you learned about so many things in this course. What goes on the to-do list? Okay, so step number one is craft your signature story. This is the story of how and why you're in financial services, or in the business that you're in, and how and why you're working with doctors. And so maybe your story is that you've always been great with money. Maybe your story is you weren't so great with money, but you learned how and you transformed your life and now you wanna help other doctors. Okay, why are you working with doctors? Well, maybe you wanted to go to medical school and, um, Life got in the way, um, 
but you've always admired doctors. You've always wanted to work with doctors. Um, maybe there were doctors in your family and you saw the mistakes that they made and you wanna keep other people from making those mistakes. So remember when you're talking with doctors, they're probably in their feeling brain. When they're talking about their money, you engage the feeling brain with stories and pictures. And so, you know, craft the signature story. And then, you know, you can always ask a doctor prospect, do you have time for a quick story? And then tell your signature story and then thank doctors for the work that they're doing. Um, step number two is plant your flag in the medical market. When a doctor Googles you and they will, make sure that you have the footprints of somebody who works with doctors. Make sure that you have social media profiles that reflect your doctor focus. Um, your email signature file should have it. Um, all of the social media um, online platforms um, use keywords. So make sure that you're using doctor related keywords and the keywords that doctors are searching for. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so that they can find you. So take a look at your website, your social media presence, your email signature file, even your phone messages, and make sure that they all reflect that doctor focus. Um, step number three, put a sign up box on your website, please, 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 please do this. Um, you are gonna be want, want to be building digital sales funnels. Doctors are gonna want to hear from you. So you want their permission to send them your pearls of wisdom so that you can digitally create those seven to 10 touch points, even if you're on vacation or you're sleeping. As far as I'm concerned, this is a requirement right now. It used to be optional, now it is required. You need to be building your lists. And I will tell you that, you know, doctors might be on your list for years before they convert, but they will convert. So you always wanna be growing your list, enough said. <clears throat> Step number four is create a positioning statement. And remember the formula for your positioning statement is I help this group of doctor to achieve this certain outcome, um, by the time you actually get your positioning statement, you're gonna wonder what was all the fuss about? This is so easy. But, but basically the reason that you want to get a great positioning statement is so that doctors can remember it. And when they're in the doctor's dining room and surgeon's lounge, they can tell other doctors about what it is that you do. That's the main reason to develop this. <clears throat> okay, next you wanna stock the shelves with your yummy treats. You always wanna deliver value with every encounter. And so you wanna have these yummy treats that you can give to doctors. So, um, <clears throat> you know, you can put your name on the cover of any of my books, Proven to Engage Doctors. You can get this as a digital file, as physical books. These are great yummy treats. You can create videos, you can create newsletters, you can distribute my articles and my newsletters. The most important thing is to deliver things that doctors actually want. Now, if you go to the Targeting Doctors site, you'll, you'll find all sorts of ways that I can be of service, ways that we can partner. I, you know, this is not a sales pitch, but I have all sorts of things, including the possibility of um, doing um, webinars or joint speaking. Um, as part of the value here, you also get your name on the cover of this book about how to get more patients starting today. Um, just as every business wants more clients, so too every doctor, no matter how busy, wants more patients. And even if a doctor is an employee, they often have to be their own rainmakers. So this is something that pretty much every doctor wants. But you might wanna create your own intellectual property that's gonna support your expert positioning. Maybe you deal with, maybe you create some checklists or some quizzes or some surveys. Okay, step number six is go out and announce your tribe. So you tell everyone, 
that I am helping cardiologists take control of their financial destiny. I am helping women doctors achieve financial parity with their main doctors, uh, with the male doctors. So basically, you want to just let everyone know everywhere that you are launching this conspiracy of service, that you've got a bunch of free educational content and people should send doctors that they know to you so that they can become educated. You're not trying to sell, you know, you're not trying to say, hey, I'm looking for doctors with $5 million in assets. Uh, that, that's not it. You want to adopt this um, spirit of service. Next, go out and speak with doctors. Okay, good things happen when you leave the office and when you have conversations. So decide how many conversations you would like to have and go out and do it. Um, this might be through your educational event. Maybe you have live seminars or webinars or videos. Um, next, start filling your pipelines. Think about those sales funnels, tweak them, and think about what those seven dates, if you will, are gonna be with doctors. And remember, as you think about any given marketing campaign, you wanna think about the golden triangle. Okay, so whom are you trying to target with this campaign? What do they want and need so that your offer gives them something that they want? You wanna be able to partner ideally with a power partner, with somebody with a list who's going to help you promote it. And last, you want to think about how you can recruit other people's resources so that you're not doing this all alone. Okay, so the, the campaigns that I'd recommend are the Do You Know campaign, where you just go out, you have a yummy treat, you let everyone you know know that you're helping doctors, that you've got this yummy treat and invite people to send doctors your way to get the yummy treat. You might wanna do some kind of fun birthday marketing. Um, it turns out, and I hope that you're all on the list and you're getting the weekly marketing tips. And in last week, I talked about how July 1st, and July in general, is a very special month. Medical school starts July 1st and, um, residencies and fellowships start July 1st. So that means that the doctors who are actually launching into their career, um, they, you know, complete their training in June and generally start their new positions around July 1st and sign annual contracts. So today there are new doctors in town. You can find them. This is like the one time in a doctor's career that they actually have time for you to take them out to breakfast. So you might want to do that in these next few weeks. Find new doctors and take them out to breakfast. Don't sell. Instead, find out more about the doctor. Find out what kinds of patients they like to treat. Um, see what you can do to support them. And if you do a good job with that, they will turn around and say, now, who are you again? What is it that you do? So great marketing for the summer. Step number nine is measure results. Um, if you are hosting seminars, what kinds of results are you getting? You know, what percentage said yes to come to your seminar? Um, what percentage actually came? What percentage said that they want to, to see you afterwards? And what percentage actually made the appointments? And then always be asking, how can I get better results? Um, step number 10 is make course corrections. So what little tweaks can you make that can help you get better results? So I create my landing pages, for example, with a vendor called Lead Pages. They're always letting you do A-B testing. So you make two different lead pages and you see which one works better. So you can always be seeing which thing works better so that you could always be striving for better I want to sincerely thank you for your participation in this course. I recognize that you could be working with any number of different clients, but I know that doctors need your help. So I thank you for your commitment and your dedication. 
also know that basically you've got lifetime access to the Academy of Physician Engagement. So now to walk my talk, as you know, I'm always trying to be more helpful. I am trying to make it easier for you to acquire doctor clients. So if you have any ideas about how I can improve the course, if there are any other products or services that would be helpful for you, please feel welcome to give me a call or drop me an email. I am always, always trying to improve. Anyway, I wanna thank you for your participation and please keep me posted. Let me know how things are going with you.